Okay. Warm welcome to Barbara Kuruga, the Thank you. member for that wonderful provincial electorate seat, Taranaki King Country. Which you were sitting in. For the rich history. Which you were sitting in. Still. <laughs> <laughs> you were in the airports in the Taranaki. And uh, <laughs> welcome to the Groundswell team there. And, and welcome everybody. Um, Doug Edmunds for putting things together for us. You know, the beautiful thing about science is that it's constantly evolving. What was proven true last year may be proven untrue this year. It's constantly developing and changing. And people are adding to it, modifying it, changing it, challenging it continuously. And uh, the negative thing about it is that somehow or another science has become politicised and has fallen into the hands of people who are not true to the fundamentals of science that have made science such an important contributor to our world and to our well-being. And uh, we're very privileged tonight to have somebody who has followed the scientific method for many years was trained in that very august body, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States, and uh, who's been in involved in the science of physics, which Harry Mowbray tells me is by far the most important discipline in science. And, and if Harry says it, I'm going to believe it. Um, and, and so having been trained in MIT, um, Dr. Tom Sheehan is uh, currently uh, involved in the, the President of the Science and Environmental Policy <coughs> Project and is President and CEO of Western Technology and Independent Consulting Group. Tom has got a great grasp of climate science and understands the issues around methane, rumen, rumen methane particularly. So we're delighted he's able to come. Um, and delighted he's able to give us a presentation tonight. He's touring around New Zealand. If you haven't got one of these pieces of paper with the meeting dates on the back of it, grab one before you go and, and go and join him at some other meeting because he's going to end up all the way down in Groundswell country in, in Southland. So um, we're, we're very privileged to have him and we're delighted he's been able to come. Uh, he travelled all the way from um, Maryland and uh, caught a plane yesterday morning, landed here at five o'clock in the morning. And for a young fellow like that, that's a pretty major ordeal. So we're, 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 very, we're very privileged and proud to have him. So Tom, come and join us and we'll hand the floor over to you. Give him a warm <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Owen, and thanks to all of you for letting me come and talk to you uh, tonight. What I'm going to say is not what you have heard on television. It's really different. And what you've heard on the media and, you know, newspapers as well as television, oftentimes says, well, there's a consensus. Well, the experts say, well, I'm not a scientist, but dot, dot, dot. And you wind up reciting something from Al Gore or one of those type of people. So I'm going to try to tell you what's really going on in real science. And I'm going to say some things that will probably be a surprise to you because they're quite opposite to what you uh, have heard from the media. So, um, I'm not supposed to just this, no. Um, advance. There we go. Ah, you're good. Okay. So first I'm going to review the work of two very fine scientists named William Van Weingarten from York University in uh, Ontario and Will Happer from Princeton University. Will Happer is one of the more eminent physicists in the United States of America. 50-year career advising the Defense Department, often on important um, detection and weapons-related things, and a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, 
which is about the highest rank you can achieve in science recognition in America. So these two guys really know what they're talking about. So that'll be the first part is to review their things. The second part is to talk about a famous number called Global Warming Potential, or GWP, and its cousins GWP star, GWP 100, and tell you why those numbers are meaningless. And the net result of all of this is that methane has no role at all in the ever-changing climate. It is, as my title says, the irrelevant gas. Technically, it is a greenhouse gas, but it doesn't do anything in the context of the climate, with real air, and in actual conditions on Earth. The bottom line is this. There are three major policies that are kind of in the works. One is to tighten the regulations, especially on farmers, more and more. Another is to put a tax on your ruminant animals. And the third is to just run up the cost for the farming community. And all three of them are completely unnecessary and they won't accomplish anything. They won't make a difference in the climate. Okay, you have to have a little background to understand this. When you're talking about atmospheric radiation and the transfer of heat from the surface of the Earth up into the sky, you have to realize the processes that are going on. The term is often used that greenhouse gases trap uh, energy. No, they slow down the progress of photons, uh, the radiation outward. And if you look at your weather overnight, you'll see that it gets mediumly cool by 10 at night, a little colder at 12, 1 to 2, colder, 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 and then 6, 7 a.m. is the coldest time of day. And what happens then? The sun comes out. And when it does, the whole process is reversed and starts over again. So uh, the Earth is never in equilibrium, but it is always trying to get to equilibrium and all these processes are headed in the direction of equilibrium. But the rotation of the Earth, night and day, is too fast for it to ever reach equilibrium. But what we're doing is a form of um, science that recognizes that difficulty and lives with it. So we don't idealize things as though it's perpetual equilibrium. We recognize that we are heading towards equilibrium. And that's an important distinction. So, you have this forcing is the energy coming in, typically from the sun, or the energy coming off the surface of the Earth. And the measurement of that is watts per square meter, and with that we can make quantitative measurements. We can do real science with actual values instead of just hand-waving about more or less. So the, um, uh, the mechanisms of energy transfer are several. There is conduction in the air, which is almost zero. There is convection, where the wind and the air currents move heat around. And then finally, there is radiation. And the only way the global system, that is the planet itself plus its atmosphere, actually drops in temperature is by radiation of warm uh, heat into outer space. So that's the way you cool. It does cool by radiation, but before radiation leaves the planet atmosphere, other things take place, notably convection of gases around from the surface up into the high altitude, up to the higher ends of the atmosphere. <clears throat> okay, one more. This drawing looks very complicated, and we could spend hours on it. But on the left, you see sunlight coming at the Earth. And on the right, you see in the sort of uh, maroon, orange, brown, brown color, the heat radiation leaving the Earth. Okay, sunlight comes in the daytime, heat leaves at nighttime, and every place on the planet changes, whether it's day or night, from hour to hour as the Earth spins. So uh, you start off with something like 340 watts per square centimeter, coming from the sun all the time in the direction of the Earth. 
And some of that gets reflected away. Those are the little upward bound yellow arrows. Bounces off the clouds, bounces off the atmosphere itself, and a little bit of radiation touches the ground or the ocean and is reflected away too. But around 51% of the uh, energy from the sun actually makes it into the earth, meaning either the land or the ocean. Then, at nighttime, it's time for that energy to get up and leave in the form of radiation of heat. And one thing that happens is ocean water evaporates, and now the moist air, air that contains more water than before, drifts upward and upward, upward through the troposphere, to the top of the troposphere, goes under the name of tropopause, and then into the stratosphere. And all along that pathway, water plays an incredibly important part as it is carried, first evaporated, and later at high altitudes it condenses and turns into snowflakes, and that makes clouds. But that process is vastly different from any of the other forms of heat transfer that the planet normally has. Water dominates. The greenhouse effect, the water cycle is extremely important. And probably one of the leading experts on Earth in the water cycle, as it's called, is a chemical engineer here in uh, New Zealand named Jeff Duffy. So if you haven't heard from before, keep your eye out for him and think. So, when molecules engage in radiation, and you think it's simple, um, a photon, a particle of radiation, gets up and leaves. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. If you have two atoms, as in nitrogen or oxygen, they're sitting there bound together, kind of like a dumbbell, we imagine it in this imaginative way, and about all it can do is either spin around or stretch back and forth. But if you've got three atoms, then it gets interesting. And this is called polyatomic molecules, because now they can twist, they can bend, they can stretch, they can do all these fun things, and when they do so, that's where you get interesting properties of the molecules that affect the radiation or the collisions that they have uh, all the time in the sky. So, um, there is something that you need to be aware of, and it comes from the science of physics called quantum mechanics, that uh, every energy level is quantized. They are separated by a little bit of energy. <coughs> and when you have quantized energy, it changes the rules by which radiation is given off a little bit. So, you wind up getting light emitted not just any place, but in very specific spectral regions, which are given the name bands. And in a band, it might be vibrating in one particular way and rotating in a thousand different ways. Uh, spinning fast, spinning slow. But all these spectral lines, quantized as they are, are crowded pretty close together. And that's what does the radiating. Um, every band has a center, and then it has what are called wings, which are the rotational states that are out to the side. And they fill up gradually as light gets absorbed. We'll see that in the picture in a minute. <coughs> now, um, what the word of importance is in chemistry is saturation. If you've ever mopped the floor, you know what a sponge does in the way of saturation. It's terrific at first, and pretty soon it's got it's gooey and it's wet and doesn't do any job anymore. The atmosphere is a lot like that. There are atoms and molecules that do a fine job of absorbing the first few photons of light that come at it, but pretty soon, as you get more and more photon, uh, more and more of these molecules, <clears throat> they're not able to do the job as well anymore. And we're going to see that too. Um, one thing you need to know is the importance of collisions. A typical molecule, such as water, as it floats around in the atmosphere, collides with a nitrogen molecule or a hydrogen molecule about a billion times per second. 
That's 10 to the ninth, for, if you like scientific notation. But what it means is these things barely have time to move at all before they get boom, another oxygen hits them, and boom, a nitrogen hits them. And so the energy that it might have had is gone in an instant. And the time it takes to radiate is oftentimes longer than one billionth of a second, and therefore these other processes are confusing things and getting in the way. This is a typical curve that we call saturation. In the particular case here, we're talking about a laboratory experiment in a chamber in somebody's lab where they are shining light, infrared light, straight through a chamber of carbon dioxide. And when you put a little dribble of carbon dioxide in there so that there's only 20 parts per million, at once, 20 parts per million is a pretty small amount, at once, the intensity that gets through drops way down. Way up there, down here, about 80% of the absorption that it is able to do is done in this very small increment at first. And when you go from 20 to 40 to 60 to 80, you add a couple of percent more. So that by the time you're at about 150 parts per million, the game is pretty near over. You've absorbed well over 90% of the possible absorption that it can do. And when everything is saturated, and that's the meaning of this curve, then the light doesn't get absorbed anymore, it goes right through it. I said light, infrared radiation and light are kind of interchangeable. Um, so, if you look here at the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere going across there, it increases 100, 200, 250. That's the so-called pre-industrial value of the pristine ages long, long ago. Uh, 250, 300, and when this particular slide was made, which is about the year 2001 or 2007, the actual amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was about 385 parts per million. That's the little blue range way out there that you can see the increment of another 20 parts per million. How much difference does it make? Can you see it? That's how slow it is. So hardly any energy is additionally absorbed, which means light in that wavelength range now goes straight through. I'm dwelling on this and taking extra time because of the fact that every single one of the greenhouse gases has a curve of the same shape. They all do the same thing with different numbers. Water, by the way, which is like 1.5%, 2% or 1% as it's dry or you're in the desert, you're in the jungle, varies all over the place, which is, confuses things too. But it has a shape just like this and a long, long time ago for the amount of water, it got all the way down there very close to the bottom and then went way out there into the other room. So water is so totally saturated that it takes up what energy it can from radiation and then lets the rest go through. Which is why on a clear day or a cloudy day you still see light, some light coming through from the sky. The greenhouse effect refers to the fact that the Earth is warmer because of these gases that are in the atmosphere. The greenhouse gas is basically number five. Water, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone. And any other tiny little gases are in such small concentration that they don't matter. You may have heard a report that a freon has such and such effect. It doesn't. There isn't any of it up there. So your water is taking up a lot of energy, and as it holds that energy, remember it didn't stop it, it didn't trap it, it just slows it down, that makes the Earth warmer. If the atmosphere is containing some of your energy, then the surface will be warmer. And in fact, water vapor alone makes the Earth about 24 degrees Celsius warmer than it would have been. The second contender is carbon dioxide. 
Carbon dioxide absolutely is part of the greenhouse effect. There's no doubt about it that CO2 matters. But it's about 8 degrees more of uh, 8 degrees C more, which is about 25% of the so-called greenhouse effect, which makes the surface of the Earth 33 degrees C warmer than it would have been if there was no atmosphere. So that's a greenhouse effect we like because it wouldn't be much fun if we were temperatures characteristic of no atmosphere. You'd be freezing, freezing, freezing to death all the time. And so the water and the CO2 really matter and it helps the Earth and we like that. That's the greenhouse effect. To this you now add additional minor gases such as ozone, etc. And approximately nothing happens. And that's the important difference between gases that are plentiful, like water at one and a half or two percent or whatever of the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide at approximately 400 parts per million. So those matter, but the lesser gases do not. So, what you have is you can draw a curve of the radiation that is transmitted, I'm sorry, the radiation first that is emitted from the surface of the Earth and then transmitted through the atmosphere. And um, that's what Weingarten and Happer set out to do. And they had a uh, calculation that was done on a laptop. It wasn't one of these big, great, big, gigantic number crunchers that you hear about from the Defense Department. These guys are so good, they figured out how to program a laptop. And at the end of the afternoon, when you're going home for the night, they press the go button and come back in the morning, and the calculation is complete. It's just a tour de force of competence in, in computational physics. So what they got was they calculated the radiation from every greenhouse gas, including the lesser ones, methane, ozone, and so forth. And they got all sorts of spectral lines, line after line after line. Remember, the, a line is when the thing is vibrating in some particular way and rotating at some particular rate, too. There are 300,000 lines. The magnitude of the computation would never have been done without the computing power that you had by about 2,000. And your cell phone in your hand now has got much more computer power than the computers that took us to the moon 50 years ago. That's how advanced computers have become. And with advanced computers, they were able to carry this out. So, what they did in their model differed very greatly from the customary way. They looked at real air, which means air that contains nitrogen, oxygen, argon, um, H2O, water vapor, CO2, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and they calculated them all. They did it, the whole thing, they did them all. And that calculation was really a first in the uh, accomplishment that you could do. And what made it really different was they put water in. You say, well, why doesn't everybody put water in? And the answer is, normally computations on gases are done using a set of numbers known as the United States Standard <coughs> Atmosphere. Uh, people in other countries uh, use it too, and it's not really a U.S. Standard Atmosphere, it's essentially a worldwide Standard Atmosphere, but it is done with no water, no H2O at all. And when you're trying to do a laboratory experiment, you like that. What you do is you take air, and before you put it into your chamber, you pass it over what's called a desiccant, so all the water gets taken out, and now the gas that enters your laboratory chamber is this artificial gas. It's called dry air. And you need it that way in order to do experiments. But when you're trying to talk about the real atmosphere, you cannot trust dry air. You'll get the wrong answers. And by the way, that's the difference between the Weingarten and Happer versus all those IPCC models that have been calculated and given huge headlines over the last 30 years or more. And that's a gigantic difference because real air and dry air are two different things when it comes to the greenhouse effect. Here's what happens. 
You look at an individual molecule, such as CO2, you look at a different individual molecule, such as methane or nitrous oxide, and golly, they're all about the same, one molecule at a time. They don't differ very much, and maybe by factor two, factor three, something like that. Uh, a polyatomic molecule of three or five atoms is going to vibrate and rotate in kind of sort of the same way, and not that much difference between them. Um, CO2 on a per molecule basis is kind of comparable to methane, CH4. And therefore, people have been doing things related to the idea of comparing methane to carbon dioxide. But doing it one molecule at a time is the wrong way to do it. And soon you will see exactly what they did wrong and why it led to the wrong answers. Anyway, all these bands where the water radiates or absorbs, where the carbon dioxide absorbs or emits radiation, they're all different. Some of them overlap, and that's very important to remember too. But they calculated them all. We found that the dominant greenhouse gas is water, H2O. Carbon dioxide is good for about 25% of the effect, and that's called the greenhouse gas and the greenhouse effect. Ozone is a most interesting gas because up in the stratosphere, ozone absorbs ultraviolet light. And you really want that because it keeps you from getting sunburned on an ordinary, normal day. Um, we probably all died of skin cancer years ago if ozone was not taking out the ultraviolet rays. But when you do the arithmetic carefully, and do the numbers, it turns out that both CH4, methane, and N2O, nitrous oxide, don't matter at all. And that is a very important conclusion that came out of these very accurate calculations. The right way to describe what they did is they got it right. We have had the IPCC making computer models, big fancy computers, for over 30 years. And somehow, the predicted temperatures always come out wrong. There's something wrong. They're typically, they're two or three times higher in their prediction of the temperature than what is actually measured. And boy, it's been disappointing. The IPCC wishes they could do better. But the reason they don't get the right answer, the reason they estimate the temperature too high, they're not working with the right gas. They're working with this imaginary gas called dry air. And you can't really expect that when you do calculations on an imaginary gas, you're going to get results that match the real world. So, what they got, and I'm quoting a few words from their abstract of their paper of 2019 here, is exceptionally good quantitative agreement with satellite observations. Okay, this, to me as a physicist, this is almost unbelievable. Here are six pictures. I'm going to slow down for a minute and try to walk you through them. Over on the right side are the experimental data. That's real measurement from satellites looking down from the, from the orbit onto the Earth. That's real. That's data. The three pictures over on the left are the calculations by Van Weingarten and Hammer. And now compare left to right in either the upper one, the middle one, and the lower one. It is stunning that there could be such incredibly good agreement. Every little up and down niche in that whole spectrum is the same in their calculations as it is in the experimental measurements by satellites. That's called exceptionally good qualitative, quantitative agreement. There's a fantastic job. To get this agreement is stunning. Now, what you have is the top two, left and right, are taken over the Sahara Desert, and that was done to have an extremely dry climate, and very little water in the atmosphere over the Sahara. The middle two, left and right, are kind of a normal area, like kind of the Mediterranean, France, Italy, United States, whatever you want. And the bottom two, for a physicist, it really blows your mind because 
You expect a certain shape of the radiation from the surface, and that gives you this smooth dotted line, which you can see in all three of the ones on the left. Way up the top, way up the top. And in the case of Antarctica, it's way down here because Antarctica is cold. So how can you possibly get more radiation than that dashed red line? The answer is that the air above the ice in Antarctica is warmer than the ice. And it is that air in which the carbon dioxide and H2O are radiating it gives you a greater boost of the outgoing radiation than you would have had from the surface itself. Nobody ever thought of this. Nobody ever imagined it could be calculated. But they did it, and they got it right. And that is the most important uh, part of all their work. So it really is a major accomplishment. This is the way you're supposed to do science. This is called using the scientific method correctly. You take data, you get measurements, you have numbers that you can really have measured carefully and you can trust. And now, as the second step, you try to come up with a theory that matches it. And if the theory matches, then you say, we've got a good model here. If the theory doesn't match, then data is supreme, theory has to be fixed. The IPCD has never been able to correct its theory properly. But Van Weingarten and Happer made a result that does match the data. This is science, this is correct science. This is what we all wanna do, is to get our theories to match the data. And when you have a computational method like theirs, which does achieve that, it becomes possible to say, now our model is telling us what the atmosphere really does, and now we can imagine and change it around to see what things would be like if the concentrations were different. So we can change carbon dioxide to zero, we can leave it at 400 parts per million, or we can double it. Or we can take 10% of that carbon dioxide, or 20 or 50 or whatever, we can make all kinds of changes. We can make changes in methane or nitrous oxide or whatever, because now we've got a model that we can trust. Because the model agreed with the experimental data, therefore, you have validated the model and you've achieved a scientific accomplishment that conforms to the rules of science. You've used the scientific method correctly. And now, you go ahead and start doing numerical experiments by varying these other gases. So, here we go with varying the carbon dioxide. Now you may have to squint pretty carefully at some of these because some of these lines are faint. That black line is what they have calculated for today today's conditions of 400, 410 parts per million. And it agrees with data, so we can say our model is doing the right thing. Then they come along and they say, let's take out all the carbon dioxide. We'll set carbon dioxide equal to zero. And they get the green curve. So, that means that this big ditch here is missing. The ditch is the absorption of infrared radi radiation by carbon dioxide. You take away the carbon dioxide, and it isn't there anymore. That's using science modeling correctly. And now, they also could do other calculations with any old amount of CO2 they wanted. So they put in double the CO2, and with that, they got the red curve. Now, after you've been squinting at that for three quarters of an hour, I will suggest you come up with your micrometer and walk up right to the screen and see if you can tell the difference. The red curve differs from the black curve by almost zilch. Very tiny little blips you can barely see. You need a, uh, practically a, a magnifying glass to see them. What does that mean in reality? It means that if you double the carbon dioxide, the amount of radiation you're going to be taking away 
is very little difference greater. You remember the curve we showed about that saturation with the red, the red steps coming out and flattening out? That's where we are. We're way out there in the 400 range. And if you take it up to 800, the difference you will make is the difference between the black curve and the red curve here. Incredibly little doesn't matter very much at all. And yet, what you've been hearing for 30 years on the TV and in newspapers is that doubling CO2 is going to be some kind of catastrophe. I'm telling you, it will not. And the model of Van Weingarten and Happer is validated, it matches the data, and you can trust it to predict what you will have under circumstances that aren't real yet, but are modelable on a computer. So, there are many, they, they did a whole bunch of these, and, uh, let's see if this one's here. Now, this is a reminder, you saw, you saw this curve before, but all the effect of CO2 happened <laughs> early on. Not it down, 80% of the emissions from the Earth's surface that CO2 was capable of taking out was done in the first 20 parts per million. There's 40, 60, 80, 100 out here. You're up there about the 90% point out here. The 300 range, when they did it, it says today, that this was done in about 2007, I think. 380 parts per million. Each step is negligible, 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 et cetera. All the way out and keep going and getting flatter and flatter. So today, about 98.5% of what carbon dioxide could do is already gone. And you double it and you get nothing more, the difference between the red and the black. Okay, you can change the numbers for the other gases. Let's change it for CO2. Uh, sorry, for CH4, methane. The black curve is what we see today with the amount of methane in the atmosphere that we know is about 1.8 per, per million. The green curve is what happens if there's no methane. Get out your magnifying glasses, folks, and look carefully. You can find with great effort a little bit of difference between the green and the black curve. It's out here. No methane at all will give you a little bit more radiation coming through from the Earth's surface, but the black curve is today's, the green curve is zero methane. Next step, try doubling the methane. Put in 1.8, about 3.6 parts per million of methane. Get the red curve. Can you see it? Can you see the difference between red and black? No, you can't. Which means that putting in more methane isn't going to make any difference. You can go out and double your herd of sheep, and you double in methane, but it isn't going to change the uh, climate one bit. <clears throat> what these numerical experiments all mean is this. If you were able to take away all the carbon dioxide, you change the greenhouse effect by 25%. So do not let anybody tell you there is no greenhouse effect or the CO2 makes no difference at all. No, it's an important contributor. But if you doubled the CO2, it would make a very tiny difference. And with the other gases, notably methane and also nitric oxide, nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dye, oxide, Nitrous oxide, sorry about that. They're so hard to find, even with a magnifying glass, you can hardly see them on these charts. So, there are other molecules that are very tiny concentrations. There's a little bit of freon in the atmosphere, a couple things like that, leaked away from refrigerators and air conditioners over 30 years. Incredibly minor amounts, terribly, terribly minor, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.1 or something. Forget all of those. They don't matter. What this implies, the implication scientifically, is that when you have agreement between theory and experiment, that's when you know you're doing something right. 
That's good science. That's what we all wish for. And frankly, folks, for 37 years, that is what the IPCC has failed to deliver. Their models have never matched the data. But Van Weingarten and Happer did match it, and therefore, you have to say they're right. And their model is the one to use rather than the IPC models. The IPCC models are called general circulation models, and they're expensive to run on great big gigantic computers, but they don't give you the right answer. If there's more CO2, tiny difference. If there's more nitrous oxide or methane, no difference at all. Imagine trying to find that red curve apart from the black curve in the methane drawing. So, you want to double CO2, CH2, CH4, methane? Go ahead. As I said, double your herd of sheep. It isn't going to make any difference at all. And uh, contrarily, or conversely, if you want to reduce methane, you're not going to gain anything either. So you can really forget about methane. It just isn't an important gas. As my title says, it is irrelevant. Three reasons why it's irrelevant. One, there isn't very much methane there at all. Water, 15,000 parts per million, 10,000, 20,000, whatever, humidity varies. Um, carbon dioxide, 400 parts per million, a serious contributor to the greenhouse effect. But there isn't enough methane to make any difference. And in particular, the area in which, in the spectrum, that methane does absorb is already absorbed by water vapor. When you work with the imaginary gas called dry air and there's no water vapor, you don't find that. You don't find it and you get the exaggerated idea that methane is more important. But in real air, water dominates completely. And finally, the other thing is that there is very little energy emitted by the Earth in the range where methane can absorb heat. Therefore, there's very little for methane to do. It can't absorb heat if it's not radiated. And where the spectral bands where Earth, Earth radiates is not where methane is. Again, here's a repeat of the slide you saw of a methane comparison. You have this general radiation, this light blue curve, it's a little hard to see, going way up high, and the difference, oops, the difference between the light blue curve and the black curve is the total greenhouse effect. That's how much radiation is absorbed by all across the spectrum. But notice that when you're out here, I shouldn't be pointing here, I'm pointing up here. When you're out here, your water is taking out a big gap between the black curve and the faint blue curve. You put methane in there and it doesn't make any difference because methane wishes it could absorb in that wavelength region, but water got there first, and water ganged up on it, and water has <coughs> dominant numbers. So that's the third of the uh, elements here, is why there is no importance to methane. <coughs> so now there was for scientific implications, there's also policy implications. Number one is, at last, somebody got it right. Van Weingarten and Hacker did the calculation right. We've got a model we can believe in, which we haven't had for 30 years. So you believe their results, and you don't believe the faulty models from the IPCC that have been giving us wrong answers for 30 years. The climate is going to change forever. It has always been changing. There's no such thing as a climate denier. If anybody in the world denies that the climate changes, it's absurd. Every scientist agrees that the climate changes, and it's going to continue to change, and it has changed. Um, your greenhouse gases do not change the fact that the climate changes. But we have these three things down here, and the, therefore, do not take expensive actions to mitigate climate change. You can't do it. Mitigation does not work. You have to adapt. 
And the climate will change. There will be another ice age someday. We've got to adapt to these things. Adaptation is what human beings do quite well. But don't waste your time trying to mitigate the climate change. Second, do not waste your time trying to strive to reduce CO2 or reduce the other greenhouse gases. They're saturated. They don't make hardly any difference at all anymore. And finally, do not impose regulations on your farmers. Do not tax them because a tax, regulation, whatever, would hurt the farmers and do nothing to change the climate. Now, we gotta review how all this came to be. These IPCC reports are very long, and 1,500, 1,800 pages, big fat things produced by serious scientists who take their task seriously and try to analyze things the best they can. That's called Working Group One. Working Group One hands over its results, and a group called Working Group Two takes it from there and says, okay, what's going to happen to us? And having reported, Working Group Three then takes it and says, gee, how can we do something about this? Well, the summary for policymakers, which is the only thing anybody reads, nobody reads these 1500 page reports, that is written not by scientists anymore, but by diplomats, bureaucrats, and people who have interests for their nation and for their own agendas which do not match true science. So people are only reading these highlights. They don't read the whole thing. And they get very busy, and they're too busy to read much. The real science is back on pages 1412 or page 683 or places in there. And you've got to be a scholar to bother reading that far back in the reports. And people just don't. So if it were to come to pass, the working group one were to say, hey, here's our results. We don't have a problem anymore. The climate can go ahead and change, and these gases aren't going to make any difference. Working Group 2 and Working Group 3 would be unemployed. And frankly, people, the folks who are diplomats and bureaucrats, don't like the thought of that. <laughs> so they resist it, and you hand them Working Group 1's results, and they write their summary, policy, summary for policymakers without paying any attention to what the scientists tried to tell them. That's a disgraceful thing. It's an abrogation of responsibility. It is a corruption of science. But it's what's really been going on for many decades. The fundamental error in the first place was that they didn't use real air. That's a colossal scientific mistake. Because they thought they made the reasoning that, oh, well, we can't do anything about water, so we won't even bother thinking about it. Let's just focus on these lesser gases. So they used the artificially constructed thing called dry air, which is great in the laboratory, but not in the real world. And they got answers that just plain don't match the reality. But real air has always some amount of water in it. And it's enough so that saturation takes place. And when saturation takes place, you are not going to get the kind of absorption that you would have had if there was only a little bit of this or that gas. Without water, the atmosphere, as I say, it just doesn't work. Nobody would be here. No animals, no plants, no anything. It would be a barren planet if there wasn't water in the atmosphere. And mainly, as you look at the greenhouse effect, be very realistic about it and realize that water is by far the dominant greenhouse gas. Water essentially calls the shots. And that's the thing you have to calculate before you fool around with calculations about methane or other minor components. Another fundamental error they made at the IPCC was that they did not understand the feedback mechanism. Weather and climates are very complex, nonlinear, coupled equation, da da da. The, the equations are subject to a mathematical condition known as chaos. And man, that makes it really tough. 
But they ignored that. They did not understand the feedback mechanism. They figured, well, if the temperature rises, more CO2 will bubble out of the ocean. Therefore, that will make the temperature rise some more, which will let some more CO2 come out of the ocean, which will raise the temperature. And they went around like this, and so the cycle was going to keep going. But in real reality, in nature, there's what you have uh, called negative feedbacks, so that these processes do not get out of hand. And if you look at the temperature charts of the last 20, 50 million years, you'll see there were plenty of opportunities where CO2 went up and down and the temperature never, never got way out of hand, even though the temperature got quite big changes too, as in some of the major ice ages that would last 100,000 years. So the climate is changing. We're not gonna be able to do anything about it, but when we try to calculate what's going on, you have to count water first, you have to understand feedback, and unfortunately, the IPCC didn't either. Okay, now, this is part two. There is this magical number of GWP, which stands for Global Warming Potential. And they have ballooned this up into the most imagine, uh, unbelievable hobgoblin you can imagine. GWP is the thing that is making everybody in the media, headline writers and so forth, really, really worried about methane. You just saw what's really going on in the real world with methane. But here's what they did. They wanted to form a ratio of whether this gas or that gas or the other gas is worse than CO2, and by how much. So, they may have a whole bunch of simplifying assumptions. They didn't know something, oh, okay, seven equal to one, we'll worry about it some other day. That isn't good science, folks, but they did it. And frankly, a lot of people in many areas uh, involving science do make these simplifying assumptions. And sometimes you get away with it, sometimes you don't. And in the case of the real atmosphere, they didn't get away with it. Okay, so in the uh, uh, report, they, they're called AR, AR1, 1990, AR2, 1996, AR4 was about 2008, we're up to AR6 now. But they explain exactly how they did this. And it's a, sadly, kind of a shambles. They did not do the calculation correctly. But they tabulated a whole bunch of data. They did a big chart, runs a whole page in one of the reports. And it looks impressive. And you get these values for these minor gases like uh, methane and nitrous oxide and, and many, many more. And those are the numbers they calculated. Those are the numbers that made it into the tables. Those are the numbers that got accepted. Those are the numbers that became folklore. Those are the numbers that further morphed into doctrine. And they were wrong, wrong, wrong. Here's how they got that way. This is what's going on in the infrared. And this is true for any gas in a laboratory. This has been true since 1859, when a scientist in Ireland named John Tyndall first made measurements of this type. Here we look from about 600 wave numbers, which means 20 microns, increasing energy all the way up to 10,000 micro, uh, 10,000 wave numbers, which equals one micron. That's the whole span of the infrared. Look what you got. Big peak due to methane. Big peak due to methane. Little peak due to CO2. Bigger peak for CO2 here. Water is over there someplace, uh, other gases, nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide. They did all this stuff. This is what a laboratory gas looks like in a laboratory chamber. And by the way, the light that is coming in is uniform light across the whole infrared. So you look at this and say, hey, what do you know? Methane is more important than CO2. Oh, CO2 is out of there. Methane, big thing here, big thing there. Wow, methane. We better worry about methane. But here's the mistake they made. They forgot about what the Earth is radiating, which is the only game in town. That's the radiation you get a chance to absorb. And if you don't pay attention to what that is, you're going to get it wrong. So now here's the same chart, except with this dot dash line here, showing the radiation emitted from the Earth. It's all down here at the low frequency, long wavelength end. 
and all this stuff out here with a big methane peak is happening in a part of the infrared where there isn't any energy coming there. It isn't, the planet is not sending out radiation at two microns or, or half a micron or three or four or five. There's no energy there. So it doesn't matter how bright or intense these are, they don't play in this ball game. They don't make any changes. And when you look over here, where water and methane are competing, you now have very little energy coming far below the peak. I keep doing this with my fingers, but I'm looking at it. What I'm talking about, here's your peak. Here you are in the uh, water methane region. Um, water, as you see, is all these black lines. And there's very little energy coming in that area. Now, by the way, when I told you before that water is the main greenhouse gas, it's because over here, in this whole region left of that drawing, there's a humongous amount of absorption by H2O. So H2O is very active over here, active out there, but these are the areas where there is remarkably less energy than there is right in the middle of the peak or what the Earth radiates. The reason CO2 is important is because it absorbs right in the middle of that range. CO2 is a very effective absorber, so it gets a higher percentage of the action than water does, even though water outnumbers CO2 by a factor of 10 or so, maybe a factor of 100. So that's a basic mistake that the IPCC made when they uh, did not pay attention to the question of what emissions they're dealing with. They tried to compare the saturation curve of two different gases. Remember the saturation curve was that thing of red, stepping down, stepping down, stepping down. Every gas has a curve like that. Different numerical values, but they're all shaped the same. And the vertical axis is the absorption, the horizontal axis is the concentration, which as we saw for CO2 is out about 400 parts per million. Methane is down about one or two parts per million. So, the concentration of CO2 in the drawing was 385 parts when they wrote this article. It's gone up since then. And CO2 absorption is already very near its saturation state. And by golly, this curve is very close to flat. Well, I want to compare the slope of two curves, one of which is steep and one of which is almost flat. So what's going to happen? The steep one is going to look a whole lot more important than the flat one because you're comparing the slope. And um, the absorption curves, all of them, decline in this steady way, very steeply at first and then kind of flat after that. So a steep slope is, by the way, a large number, a large negative number. And a flat slope is a very small negative number. So, again, here's what they all look like. This is CO2, but if you change the numbers on the axis, you get methane, you get H2O, you get something like that. They all have roughly the same saturation shape, even though the numerical values are different. This is what I call the diminutive denominator problem. When you have a numerator divided by a denominator, you get a number called the quotient. We've all known that since third or fourth grade. And when you get a tiny, tiny, tiny denominator, you're pushing pretty close to dividing by zero. Well, you can't divide by zero, but you can divide by numbers close to zero. And when you do, with a reasonable numerator, kaboom, the quotient blows up really large. And that's what they did. Their ratio of methane to CO2 was formed by this comparison of slopes, which is totally unrelated to the reality that we saw Van Weingarten and Hacker calculate. So you wind up with CO2 being nearly flat, CH4 is falling steeply, and so the numerator is big, the denominator is small, the quotient will be gigantic. And you get these numbers, such as 28 for methane. Allegedly, methane is 28 times worse than carbon dioxide. Is that what you saw a minute ago on the curve where they evaluate the green, the red, and the black for methane? Hell, no. Huge difference between this method 
and the correct method. Nitrous oxide, the number turned out to be about 300. And if you take some of these exotic freons, and there isn't hardly any of, those numbers are coming out over 1,000. This system of calculation has produced ridiculous numbers. But the one thing that's nice about a ridiculous number is that it breeds headlines. You say it on television and you gain eyeballs. The stuff that's exciting is these numbers that are way out of sight. And the fact that they're wrong has never bothered the media people at all. <clears throat> Let's go and what's flamboyant and exciting and print it or put it on TV and never mind if it isn't true because that's the science business. Well, the scientists make mistakes here and as a result, these rumor level things have been blown up way out of proportion. And it's a tragedy because they're talking about clobbering farmers with taxes damaging all kinds of economic uh, issues uh, in, in the economy of your country and in the other countries, all because of faulty numbers calculated in a ridiculous and stupid way. So here's your policy implications. Believe what Van Weingarten and Happer are telling you because they followed the scientific method, they used science correctly, they got agreement between their theory and the actual data from satellites. That's science. That's real science. This numerated and denominator stuff I just showed you is make-believe. It isn't even real science. And do not believe what you read in a summary for policymakers put out by the IPCC, because the summary for policymakers is often thought up by diplomats and bureaucrats who are not paying attention to their own scientists. They pay these guys good money to write science reports and then they shelve them and just write what they feel like. The greenhouse gases cannot change the climate, so don't try. Don't take expensive actions trying to mitigate things. Don't strive to reduce carbon dioxide or, or the other greenhouse gases. And for heaven's sakes, do not impose new regulations on the farmers. That would be a real harm economically, whether here in New Zealand, Ireland, the Netherlands, or even in the United States. There's no sense punishing the farmers for something that does no gain at all. So that's the end of my presentation. I will be happy to answer your questions, and I hope that as farmers, representative farmers, all of you will feel more confident in your own position that you can stand up against these guys and say, we're not going to cave in to agreement about this or that tax because they're totally unnecessary, they are unfair, and us farmers really, really oppose this. Questions? Yes, thank you. Good. instead of using real air that contains H2O. And you have to do the calculation involving H2O, and the guys who did it were Van Weingarten and Happer, and six consecutive AR reports from the IPCC did not. So that very fundamental error lies at the root of a lot of these problems. So, so my question was, um, as Wingarden and Harper had peer review by other scientists. Indeed, they have. I have seen uh, some of the peer reviews. I commissioned one or two from a couple of Europeans that I thought very highly of. 
and they were all very favorable and good. But certain journals who fundamentally want to keep this stuff out have written a peer reviews that is laughable, that is silly, but is enough of a smokescreen to get by a 26-year-old assistant editor with a degree in basket weaving from someplace or other who's got a job as an assistant editor. And so they've been excluded from some of the more prestigious journals, which is a crime. You know, it ought to be illegal, people ought to go to jail. But so far they've been able to suppress good work. Will Happer, member, a uh, fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, figures, I don't have to take this crap from anybody, you know. And he posted everything where you can find it, a place called ARXIV, and everybody in the world can read exactly what he did, and a lot of people have read it, and a lot of people have been convinced that he did it right. And I'm privileged to be the guy named in the acknowledgments of their very first paper in 2019, where it says, we thank Tom Sheehan for the idea, which was kind of nice. But they really accomplished a tremendous amount, and the fact that SUNY journals, in a phony way, are trying to suppress them, is not stopping a guy at the quality of Will Happer. Christian here. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, it was interesting what you were saying about the methane and nitrous oxide, because one of the arguments that the, um, the climate alarmists are saying that as the temperatures are rising, you're going to find all this permafrost up in the uh, up in the subantarctic area, you know, is going to be releasing all the methane and uh, and and into O that is kind of locked up there. But you were saying, well, even if that methane is released, it's really going to have very very little effect. Exactly. On, yeah. On the planet, so. The uh, releasing all the methane from the permafrost lacks a correct understanding of feedback. Real system processes on the Earth tend towards equilibrium, and if you push them away from equilibrium, they try to get back to equilibrium. And so that argument about all the permafrost is a specious argument because uh, it just won't all go away. But even if it does go away and you were to triple, quadruple, or five times the methane, as we saw, it doesn't make any difference. There just isn't enough of it, and whatever methane tries to absorb has been captured by H2O first. So methane can't compete with H2O. Sure. Yes, I'd like to mention, I believe there's more scientists than the two colleagues you mentioned, like Judith uh, Curry mm -hmm. and um, Stephen Coonan and all that, so mm -hmm. it's not just that, but I heard you on the radio this morning, and it seems all the skeptics have to be of a certain age and retire, or they'd be out of the job. Would you like to comment on that? If you were listening this morning, it has to be the broadcast from last week. When I was on today at about 12.30, I only had about two minutes, so I didn't, I didn't bring that up. But last week, when I was on for a longer period of time, I did discuss it. Um, having tenure really helps when you're at a university. And if you're an assistant professor, you're not going to get promoted unless you bring, bring in big contracts, and the contracts come from the government, and the government calls the shots. And the um, Eisenhower, just days before the conclusion of the second term, early January 1961, gave a very famous speech that many scientists pay a lot of attention to, which warned of the dangers of sort of a military industrial complex taking over and dominating science. And by golly, we've seen that happen. It's happened in the last 50, 60 years, and it has really harmed science quite a bit. Good. Another one. Here's Harry. In, can you just explain perhaps a little bit more for the people here about why water um, dominates um, because of the spectral um, structure and once one of those spectrums is taken up, mm -hmm. then it can't be taken up by another one it's because of the coupling. Okay. There's a principle in quantum mechanics that no two energy states can be uh, occupied at the same time by, by uh, gases. And that forces this quantization, which gives you a little bit of separation between the vibration states and the various rotational lines. So that's there in the quantum mechanics of atoms and molecules. But what Harry's referring to is the fact that H2O can absorb different things. Um, 
a CO2 molecule emits or absorbs a photon coming up from the Earth, and then quickly re-radiates it or collides with the nitrogen and loses its energy that way. Or an oxygen comes along and hits it and jumps it into a higher state. All this stuff is going on at a furious pace, 10 to 9 times per second, billions of a second. And um, the complexity of it, the collisions and the radiation is a mighty complex deal. And, but the dominant player in the game is H2O. Neither nitrogen nor uh, oxygen play in this game. They don't absorb or emit in this range of the infrared. So the reason the sky is blue in the daytime is because of scattering of sunlight off of uh, nitrogen and oxygen molecules that make the sky look blue. But in the infrared, they're just not there. They're not active. So even though H2O is like 1% or 2%, it is the first thing that can do something in the infrared because it is three atoms and it's a, a more flexible and bendable molecule than something like nitrogen or oxygen is. So nitrogen is the biggest gas that can do anything and it does the job as best it can. Uh, absorbing, re-emitting, colliding, all these things, exchanging energy with its surroundings, with the other molecules, and radiating it away. And every now and then, one of these radiated photons is headed upward, and some of them escape. But most of what escapes, if you give a nitrogen, uh, sorry, uh, H2O molecule radiates at say 10,000 feet, by the time it gets up to 20,000 feet, it's been reabsorbed, and there's more collision, and it gets lost. But when you start getting up high, like the top of the troposphere, where water is frozen out in the clouds, then your upward bound photons have a reasonable chance of leaving, and when they leave out in outer space, the planet gets cooler. And that's the mechanism. So, but not, again, water dominates the whole thing. Who, who played Sally Oval or Bull Rush when they were in school? <laughs> I'm showing my age of it now. <laughs> right? Remember, you had a group of people in the middle, and you had some people on the line wanting to get across the other side. Well, when the sun comes out in the morning, imagine a, a photon on its own reflected off the Earth's surface and it just wanted to head out into space. Sitting out in the middle of the bull rush team is one single methane molecule. Alongside it is a couple of hundred CO2 molecules. Alongside them is three, four, five thousand molecules of water vapor. So when that photon takes off to go across that field, he's up against one methane molecule, a couple of hundred CO2 molecules, and three, four, five thousand water vapor. Guess who's going to catch him? <laughs> Guess who's going to catch him? There's one, and, and, and look, even, even if, we, if we give uh, methane two guys, we double methane. All of them are still going to catch the photon, isn't it? Yeah. You know, three or four thousand. Yeah. And, and what's worse, what's worse is, is that, is that the poor methane guys can only operate on part of the field. The water vapor guys can catch them wherever he goes across the field. Now, that's a crude analogy, and I apologize to No, you. it's a good I'm analogy. It is a very good analogy. analogy. But that's the reality of it. To pretend that one single molecule can outsmart four or five thousand. It's just ridiculous. And that's what simplicity of it. Yeah, yeah, one more question. Yes, sir. Tell me again, right, I'm a simple man. Why the sky is blue? Tell me again, I'm just... Say, say the question why again. Why the sky is blue? Why the sky is blue? Why is the sky blue? Oh, the, why is the sky blue? Sunlight, which is multiply colored, including uh, infrared, uh, visible, and ultraviolet. Uh, when the sunlight arrives in the vicinity of the Earth at fairly high altitudes, it will sometimes scatter, that is not the absorb, but just bounce off of nitrogen and oxygen molecules. And when it does, and it goes sideways, instead of coming straight down to the Earth, 
the other uh, atoms and molecules of the uh, sky are given a little extra light, and they light up, and the net effect of the scattering, which is very strongest in the ultraviolet, but it's still somewhat in the visible. And by about 5,000 angstrom units, which is sort of at the border of green and, and yellow, the effect goes away. So it's only your shorter wavelengths, higher energy, it gets scattered in this way. But it's scattered all over, and if you look up, you don't see the reds, you don't see the yellows, what you see is blue. It's not blue out in space, by the way. <laughs> That's right, yeah. If you're up in, a, in a, uh, an astronaut in, in a uh, space station, you do not see that. But it's seen on the ground when you're looking up into the sky and you're looking at an awful lot of molecules that have been uh, bouncing light around ever since the light came into the vicinity of the atmosphere. Okay. Yeah, no. um, yeah, just um, here in New Zealand, you have politicians and, and uh, obviously the government departments, like the the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research and the Minister for the Environment, they are kind of dancing to the IPCC tune and their science at the moment. Now, if we um, are going to be driven by what they're saying, one of the counter um, things we've got is that methane only lasts 30 years, supposedly before it breaks down back into just um, carbon dioxide and water, as I understand it, you may correct me on that. So, methane, go ahead, well, finish your question. Yeah, so in 1990, we had X number of animals that were mm -hmm. um, ruminants in New Zealand, and they were releasing so much methane, whereas today the numbers or the amount of methane is slightly less than what it was in 1990. Mm -hmm. So therefore, one of the arguments is that the, we are, our livestock are no longer contributing to any form of uh, global warming if we use the IPCC models. And I just wondered if you had any comments about that. Yeah, um, as we've seen from the calculated examples of no methane, regular methane, double methane, where it doesn't make any difference is done what we call the noise level, almost imperceptible to find. Um, the methane that any animal emits today will rattle around in the lower atmosphere, called the troposphere, for something resembling about five years. And then, but it eventually drifts up into the stratosphere. And once in the stratosphere, when the sun comes up the next morning, photons are there, provide energy, and quickly, uh, methane collides with an oxygen, it's a photon handy, and it's essentially what you call burning combined with oxygen. But methane plus oxygen, it goes through a whole bunch of steps, uh, hydroxyl radicals and all that. <clears throat> the overall chemical reaction, sort of putting a ball around the whole thing, is methane plus oxygen goes to CO2 plus H2O. So you have now increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by 1.8 parts per million. You increase the water in the atmosphere by 1.8 parts per million when water was 15,000 parts per million. It didn't make any difference. It didn't even make any difference for the new CO2 you produced. Those are very drop-in-the-bucket level amounts for those more important gases like water and CO2. But that's what happens to methane after about something like five years. And the best data we have for carbon dioxide is that tends to last maybe 10 years. Claims that it's a thousand years or a hundred years are absolute nonsense, you know. And, and uh, I didn't bring that up in this talk, but they are absolutely wrong. They're due to clumsy and inadequate um, a curve fitting of a function to a collection of data where it was inappropriate and not realistic. And so, of course, they got ridiculous answers, including the idea that CO2 lasts for hundreds of thousands of years. It's not true at all. Christian Baker. The, um, the modeling and the, the correlation of the scientific um, um, the, the evidence, actually the um, satellite data, is that relatively recent or has it been around for ages and just been ignored? Oh no, the satellite data is relatively recent. And there was no satellite data of this type until 1979. So all satellite data is the last 45 years. 
Um, and you can pick any random day you want, and if you believe you have a number for the humidity, relative humidity, you can go ahead and do this calculation for that particular day. Or you can take an average atmosphere at a place like Hawaii, Auckland, Johannesburg, London, New York, whatever you want, and with those composition of that atmosphere that's realistic, you can do these calculations if you want to. But, but so the, the, the research, the woodshed paper at some stage, is that recent or has that been around for quite a while? Oh, no, no. The uh, publications by Van Weingarten and Happer began in 19, sorry, 2019. Okay, yeah, yeah. But uh, not even five years ago. So this is new, new knowledge. Tom, without diverting away, just tell us a little bit about ice core and the work that's been done and, and looking at ice cores and particularly relative to whether those ice cores reveal that carbon dioxide has gone up before temperature or temperature has gone up before. Yeah, what you do is you take an ice core by drilling someplace like Antarctica where the ice is a couple miles thick. You know, it's like 10,000 feet of ice on top of Antarctica. And you drill with not a boring bit, but a kind of a, a circular cutter that winds up getting you a slice of ice that is about this diameter and it's long, as in hundreds of feet. So what you have then is a record of what the ice has been doing for the last one year, 10 years, million years, thousand, billion, billion, etc. You go down with an ice core, and the best data runs back about 800 million years. So um, you slice through the ice core and can see how much CO2 was in there that has been trapped for 800 million years or 300 million years or whatever. And with that information, you can see how um, you have had the uh, CO2 going up and down. Now, also, in the nation of Oman, which is in the Middle East, they found some caves. And in the caves were these real long stalagmites and stalactites. And when they took one of those, hanging from the ceiling, and analyzed it, they found a certain amount of um, C14, a certain amount of O18. Uh, by O18, I mean oxygen with an uh, atomic weight of 18, where there are eight protons and not eight neutrons, but 10 neutrons. So it's a, uh, it's a special isotope. And these isotope ratios enable you to find out what the temperature was way, way back long ago. And so they have a temperature record that is constructed that goes back many millions of years. They've got a CO2 record that goes back many millions of years. And fundamentally, they don't have anything to do with each other. They wiggle, they go up and down, they vary, but there is no consistent pattern by which the CO2 and the uh, temperature vary together. We have good scientific reason to believe that when temperature goes up later on, by about 600 years, the CO2 will go up. And if temperature comes down, then later on, the CO2 will come down. But there is no evidence at all it links CO2 going up to causing the temperature to rise. Temperatures rise and fall on their own. CO2 rises and falls on its own without any connection between either of them. Excellent. Any other questions? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, <coughs> a couple of observations. Well, one question. Uh, just to confirm, therefore, that. Meet the, the, we often heard about the tipping point, the, the point of no return from, uh, from methane escaping into the atmosphere. You're quite, uh, uh, your model, or the, the, the one you discussed, makes it quite clear that it's not going to have any effect on, on climate change. Is that right? Absolutely is right, yeah. Your, your tipping point thing was something that made headlines something for newspaper or TV reporters to yak about, but has no scientific validity at all. Okay, the second point is that um, what this science suggests, or this version of the science, because it is a version of the science, 
um, it goes against the whole world's understanding, and especially, especially our governments that are definitely going down the taxing. Tax. So we have to, um, you know, this is a very, very, very serious issue that I would have thought um, I've heard more about, and I know what you're going to say because me, you didn't pick it up. <laughs> but can, can you comment on this because it's such a big issue? It is a huge issue. We have a job to do with a lot of headwinds. The momentum behind the climate alarmism is great. Uh, long before there was a Greta Thunberg out there saying, how dare you, there were teachers in classrooms teaching children terrible things about polar bears being all killed off and just starving or disappearing. About um, they, The teachers should have been telling their kids that CO2 is plant food. That's a third grade science thing, okay? But to come along and scare children, as has been done for not just lately, but for probably two or three, gen two or three decades, is a terrible way to treat children. But they did that because of the momentum that gathered behind some of these more extravagant claims. But an extravagant claim is still an extravagant claim, even if it makes a juicy headline and looks good on television. So the role of the media in this whole thing is very serious, and I think the media um, has a lot of accounting to do, and must be held accountable for their love of the headline above the fold, all this stuff, for their love of the eyeballs of the TV watching, and their willingness to say things or print things or balloon up things that are tiny and minor effects while they ignore the important stuff because it isn't interesting. There was an event just last October where the working group one of the IPCC said, of these standard scenarios, the extreme one that shows overheating heating is absolutely false, not suitable for any application, take it out, throw it away. We regret that we thought it up at all 30 years ago. And we were using it as a guardrail, essentially. One unrealistic scenario on the low side, one unrealistic scenario on the high side, hoping to get people to stick to the realistic ones in the middle. But the media took the results from the unrealistic one, ballooned it way up, made a big deal out of it, and thus distorted the knowledge of the general public by a severe amount. And that's a real tragedy, and it's a corruption of the scientific method. A, a good example of, of how the science moves, evolves, and progresses it, it is, is to look at AR6, the last IPCC report. And, and what it did in the scientific section, which is the working group one, they said, sorry, we got it wrong about the importance of methane. Uh, and what, what they said was, we've decided that methane is only about um, uh, a third to a quarter of the strength that we said previously. So if you look through, and I can give you the page number in AR6 in the scientific group, they cut the estimate of the effect of methane by three to four hundred percent. Now what that means, and this is really important, because what we have in New Zealand is politicians saying that up to half of our greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock. Now, the AR6 the AR report said, no, that's not true. That's not true. We've now found, science has moved on, we've now found that it's about 300 to 400% less than what we thought it was when we did our earlier report. Okay, so that's evolution. That's the way science works. It progresses. And now we've got these two guys, esteemed scientists and Happer and Vin Garten coming out and saying, well, no, we've done some more work. And we've found that some of the earlier stuff was wrong too. That happens in science all the time, in every discipline. So we go with the current science, not yesterday's, not the political stuff. No, there was not a question over here. Yeah, you, you mentioned 400 parts per million. Now, uh, in science in school, when we were kids, uh, we were told that, you know, there's a, the first thing like in the morning, it probably is 400 parts per million. 
but they, you never hear them say that during the day we get some sequestration and you know, plants grow and the fruits grow and the grass grows. You never hear them say, and I know, it's round about three, 230 parts per million if you take a 24-hour average. But uh, the, we, we never hear that. No, what happens is that in a single day, it's not particularly important because while one thing's happening on this side of the earth, the other side of the earth is getting something different. From northern to southern hemisphere, you do find a discrepancy because there's so much more land mass in the northern hemisphere. But even that is small. What you really see is in the seasons. Each year, um, CO2 goes up by several parts per million and then comes back down. But the overall increase year over year is about one or two parts per million steadily. But in, within a year, there's a seasonal change up and down in the CO2, which again is traceable to the fact that there's a greater amount of land in the Northern Hemisphere. And so when it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere and all your deciduous trees have lost their leaves, then your CO2 in the atmosphere is reasonably high. Spring comes, the leaves start to grow, and the leaves grab CO2 and turn them into, into plant food, and so the CO2 comes down a little. So if you look at the data from someplace like um, Mauna Loa in Hawaii or Bering Head in New Zealand, you will see that the CO2 has been going up, but in a sawtooth pattern. And the sawtooth are each year seasonal changes. But you just will not see a CO2 change on a daily basis. You cannot measure that with any precision at all. The seasonal changes you can see. Take a couple more. There's one near the back. Was a question? Anybody else? Chuck? Yes, I was just going to ask you to draw the comparison between how science has changed with continental drift. Everybody thought the guy talked about continental drift was totally wrong. Wegener, yeah, in the 1920s. He said there was continental drift and he was laughed at and ridiculed until about 1966 or 68 when they finally figured out that, oh yeah, that's right. And any kid nowadays, or even when I was a kid, I looked at a globe and said, gee, South America would fit nicely right underneath Africa. So if that's visible to a kid in grade school, it kind of should have been visible to the, the grand experts of geology. But Alfred Wegener, um, I think he died before 68, but um, his uh, insight, his accomplishment, his understanding was easily worth the Nobel Prize because it has majorly revised what we think about the way the, the uh, surface of the Earth changes over the, century, over the millennia. Very good. Thanks, Tom. Oh, yes, here we go. Uh, just going to say, you must come across a lot of scientists that argue against you and say you're yeah, wrong. What's the main point of argument that look at they think that you're on the wrong opinion? What's the main argument of science pro warming? What, what's the? How would they argue with you? What would they say? What is your opposition, John? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, there has been uh, the argument going on that the. Uh, Earth is going to warm up even more than it has now. I think that's correct. About the middle of the 19th century, 1850 or so, the Little Ice Age came to an end and we started to get some warming. Uh, a lot of glaciers melted and so forth. And that has persisted for about 180 years now. I think it's going to go on for another three, eh, 200 years more. Because there's a cycle in the climate of about a thousand year length. That's why we have such things as the so-called warm, Roman warm period. Well, to go way back, the Minoan warm period, the Roman warm period, the medieval warm period, and today's warm period. So I expect to see by about the year 2200 or so, uh, the temperature probably will peak about another one or two degrees C higher. And then it will start down. And those who are still around six centuries from now may find themselves in a comparatively cold situation. But mankind has adapted. 
for a hundred thousand years and we sure can keep on adapting because a change in a hundred years of one degree C is nothing to worry about. But it is going to happen and it has happened in the past and it will keep on happening. Excellent. We've, um, we're very grateful for Tom. He's actually going to be heading uh, south after being at the groundswell um, what number are you? RM89. It's in the rural, rural what's it called? Rural living area. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. At, at, at the um, field day tomorrow. So if you want to go and have a chat uh, with Tom, he'll be there with uh, Laurie and, and, and Bryce and the rest of the Groundswell team. Welcome to go and meet him there. He then goes south to um, Manawatu, Wairapa, Wellington. He was hoping to meet some colleagues. Um, and then into the South Island. So if you want to know what the program is, it's on the back of this. Um, grab one of these, which is quite available here. And, um, grab one of the, the, the field days tomorrow. Um, and also, if you want a few facts, and they're sort of random facts, you can pick up one of these to have a look at. Uh, give you something to uh, read um, when you've got to read it. I want to say thank you to all of you for having me, and honestly, the quality of your questions tells me that you're really paying attention and you really care about the issue. You're not a TV audience. Um, you're not just people who read the comment pages and then maybe glance at the front page once in a while. But you're taking this issue seriously. And I think that taking it seriously is the way um, truth will come out. But a cornerstone of truth where science is involved is to follow the scientific method and make sure your theory matches the data. And if your theory doesn't match the data, you can't change the data. You gotta fix your theory. And one of the raps against the IPCC is that they have readjusted temperatures from back early in the 20th century to make them seem to be lower, causing the present temperatures to appear to be relatively higher. That's cheating. They can't do that, honestly. So hold them to the standard of good science. Remind people who talk about the summary for policymakers that they better read the inside of the report. And finally, when you hear somebody begin a sentence with, I'm not a scientist, but watch out for that second clause. We've got a late question. Yeah, just, uh, just wondering, um, is there a website that's been filmed where we can see it later? Is it, can you give us? I think they're taping it and it will be available for viewing later on. Yeah, so how do we get We're not quite sure yet. We'll, we'll find out. We're not quite sure. We'll be on uh, probably the ground floor. Yeah, uh, we'll pick out. Yeah, we'll pick it up. Thank you. Excellent. And remember, while we're focused on science tonight, the politicians, God bless them, wrote something called the Paris Accord. Remember yes. hearing that? Yeah. The Paris Accord? An article to, um, clause two, of the court says that government should not institute any measures to reduce greenhouse gases if it threatens food production. Okay, that's the word, if it threatens food production. The Irish, God bless them, are about to start slaughtering 60,000 cows a year because they think they have to meet some crazy uh, objective, and uh, that's we've seen what's happened in Holland, in the Netherlands, there's been several other countries, and, and, and that's, that's it. It simply says that we just can't, as a, as a nation that produces more food to ahead of population for export than any other in the world, we can't afford to take away from the people who are hungry in the world the right to be able to eat on the back of the cook's life. Look, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. We appreciate it very much. And, and you know, Tom is not a young man. You can see that. But he's made a major sacrifice flying down here to New Zealand, wandering around the country, speaking to people like you. Show your appreciation.